Coming up, we follow the team as they start their epic photo challenge, sparks start flying, literally, as we take advantage of the long winter nights, we show you the cheapest way to get great wildlife shots, and we journey to a remote Scottish island in search of a dramatic photo. Welcome to another episode of Photography Online. As well as everything just mentioned, we also have our biggest ever prize to give away, a week-long winter photo holiday here on the Isle of Skye. If you entered last month, keep watching to see if you'll be our lucky winner. Before that though, we have got a challenge at stake. If you saw last month's show, then you'll know that I laid down an ambitious task for some of the team to photograph all 15 UK national parks in just seven days. When we last left them, they were in position at their first park, the Cairngorms in Scotland, waiting patiently for the clock to officially start counting down. We're lucky to have Acura's watches keeping time for our challenge and making sure there's no cheating going on. Let's see how they got on on their first day of what is surely going to be a week they'll never forget. Previously on the National Parks Challenge. I have come up with a new challenge for you if you're up for it. Challenge always sounds good. Is that even possible? Meet me in Edinburgh, 24 hours. I'll be there. Good Welcome to, to my camper Thank van. You. What's he doing here? It could always be worse. It could be worse. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Hey, where's Ruth going? Be nice to each other. I'm off, I'm sorry, I'm gone. Can't believe she's done this to us. Come on, yes. James. Makes sense, come on, come join us. Where am I sleeping? I know, it's your problem, doesn't bother me. After not a lot of sleep on our first night in the motorhome, James and I set off into the Cairngorm woodland to see if we could find a suitable scene, making the most of the calm, overcast conditions. Although there was a very slight breeze, we had come to a sheltered lock which we hoped would provide some mirror-like reflections and get our challenge off to the perfect start. Well, it was meant to be about reflections, but we've been a bit scuppered here with well, good old Scottish rain. Quite a lot coming from upstairs, isn't there? A bit of rain, never mind. I'm so sure we'll make it work somehow. Should we have a little look around? We'll have a little explore first, but we might have to try and find a, a plan B, I think. Well, it's, I think it's worth, before we escape somewhere else, I've got some trees we can frame, a bit of mist up in the background. Yeah, we can lose the, the sky altogether there as well, yeah. can't we? All right, let's, let's give it a go. Woodland photography is one of those environments where a polarizer really comes into its own. By reducing the reflections off of wet foliage, it helps to saturate the subtle colors and bring the woodland to life. Yeah, it makes a bit of a, a difference just to the bracken. I don't think it works too badly. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it, really? All things considered. Well, considering when we arrived, we didn't think we were gonna get anything at all. That actually marries up nicely, perfectly arched tree. Yeah, foreground colour, perfect. So we were off and running with our first shot secured, but we didn't want to rely on only the one image. So we made the most of our surrounding scenery to get some other options in the bag. What about this here then, Harry, using a bit of symmetry with this tree here? Yeah, in a bit tighter than we were. I think we were a 35 mil there, but go into 80, 90, maybe even a 100 mil. Yeah, okay, And okay. we don't need anything up or no foreground, just go in with that, say all those shapes and lines. Mm -hmm. It works really nicely. It's no very skyline at all. Quintessential Scottish woodland, I think. Well, I reckon we got that. What do you think, Harry? I think we got something, but it's certainly not getting any better now. The sky is clearing, the atmosphere has gotten worse, so we might as well head on and we might get lucky. If there's a bit of light and a big mountain view, then we can stop and get it, but if not... We've lost all the atmosphere in here anyway, yeah. that's for sure. 
Another sure thing was that we were getting hungry, so we headed back to see what Marcus had rustled up for our first breakfast. As we neared the motorhome, the unmistakable scent of bacon floated on the wind, guiding us home. Wonder what he's got for us, Harry. Shall I reveal? Better be special, he did promise. Let's see anyway. See what he's rustled us up then? Better be yep. Check that bad boy out. What the hell is that? It's a brioche, it's a, a vanilla tear and share. It's not brioche. even, we've got, we've got gas, we've got frying pans. What's it? Tear and chair. Look, watch. I will demonstrate. Look, I'm tearing. With those lovely hands. I'm not sharing. eating. I'm not. You've not, sharing. Not, you've not washed your hands. Fueled on the most disappointing of breakfasts, we got on the road and started heading south. But we hadn't gone far before we chanced to cross another potential photo for Ruth's calendar. An old derelict house, looking particularly sorry for itself, is always going to provide an interesting subject matter, especially in conditions like these. I grabbed a camera and exited the motorhome via the tradesman's door to check if I could find an angle on the house which made the most of the low-lying mist on the distant hills. While Marcus parked the van, I discussed all the options with Harry. It's a good spot this, Harry, wasn't it, from the van? Um, but time's against us here, isn't it? Because this mist's lifting. But we've got the building on a good 45 degree angle. Yeah, so that's working oh, really well. And we've got the building nice on the left. Nice with the other one there. Yeah, it is beautiful, but isn't it? I can't see any of the background from here, so. And we're skylining everything. Um, let's just try it a bit further back. Yeah, let's try and it considerably further, I think. In. And then we've got this building here as well. So if we can get this in, that might work even better, right? We've got to get a bit of a shift on here though, because that, uh, yeah, the mist is going. Yeah, hold on, look, that's better now. By increasing our distance to the cottage, the hills behind it become proportionally bigger, therefore helping us to record the scene in its surroundings rather than just a record shot of the cottage itself. Yeah, we can get this fence line leading in. Even at the limitation of the fence line, we still weren't quite far enough away, so we hopped over. This provided some welcome foreground and helped to frame the subject, giving a more three-dimensional feel to the shot. So we've solved a bit of the problem with the road there, putting some fencing in front of the road. It's a perfectly balanced composition. Shame about the uh, branches. Well, I don't mind that overly. It's not the end of the world. There, I think there might be another frame actually with some branches yeah, there. There, there you go. So it balances it, I thought there was. Um, but for a calendar, what Mistress Ruth wants there, I reckon that'll work pretty well. And actually the mist is picking out the building and giving that separation, the all-important separation. Mm -hmm. But I think that's probably the frame there. Should we give it a rating? It never works for me. Rating set to one, that's not good enough. I've made it rated five now, it's five stars. Yeah, it looks much better now. For a calendar, we felt this was a better suited subject than our first woodland shot. But let us know what you think in the comments. With almost half the first day gone, we were aware that the clock was ticking. So we got on the road to our next national park, Loch Lomond and the Trossachs. With James driving, myself navigating, and Harry researching where to go at our next location, there was no time for relaxing. And it became obvious that this was going to be a very tiring week. So that's the Cairngorms well and truly ticked off. And we're here in the Trossachs now. Yeah. I'm a bit peckish as... Uh, yeah, well, Ruth we left yeah. us something, but she what? She left us some goodies. So um, I can't remember who uh, everything's for, but I'm sure we can work it out. Farley's Rusks. There you go. Uh, a Rioja. A Rioja, yes, yes, thank you. Rioja, but as Harry likes to call it, Rioja, that's mine. Okay. Well, that's that's going to last me, what? What's oh, actually know, A minute. I thought it was like a joke box, look at that. <laughs> uh, I reckon the mineral water and the pork pie must be for me. Is it sparkling? Yes. Uh, the brie. 
goes well oh, with the wine. Well, I'm having that. And chocolate milk, perfect with the. Uh, I mean, you, you think it's funny. I mean, this is great. Well, this is great as well. Are you um, happy? I'm happy, yeah. Would you fancy a pork pie? Uh, I mean, I won't say no. There you go then. It looks slightly bigger in my hand. As do most things. Fueled on the most disappointing of lunches, Harry and I ventured down to the water in the hope of the wind subsiding and some much needed reflections appearing. Typically, we had witnessed the perfect conditions just as we had arrived. But now that we were ready to take some photos, the light, of course, had become flat and the water had become bumpy. So this scene here is one that I photographed before, mm -hmm. but in autumn when obviously everything over there is very colourful, but I think it still works at this time of year because what is perceived as a castle, it's actually a hotel. Yeah, no, it looks but nice though. It looks like a castle and that's all that's important. That stands out a lot better at this time of year. So we need two things here. We need sun on the castle which obviously is coming and going so that's not the uh, the difficult bit in fact a bit more is about to hit it in a minute but we also need the wind to die down yeah and when we arrived this was much smoother wasn't it so we we're getting a nice reflection but typically we've come down we found the location and all of a sudden the wind's picked up but this is the challenge of trying to do so many parks in such a short we've time not, we've not got the time really despite waiting for an hour the winds were reluctant to comply. But as we were about to wake James from his afternoon slumber, the conditions we had been waiting for suddenly appeared from nowhere. So I sprung into action. That's looking perfect at the moment. Are you getting yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, no, it looks great. Are you focused on the castle? No, the reflection. I'll do. Have you exposed it properly? Uh, should be, yeah, no, it's fine. Okay, because I can always take it if you can't get it right. Do you not trust me or something? What gives you that impression? Well, look, you bought a backup. I know, exactly, a backup. There you go, backup look, in case right, you look, don't... Nailed, done. Okay, that's good actually, isn't it? Against all the odds, we were somehow managing to be getting the shots we were needing, but this was only day one of seven, so we still had a long way to go. That's the two national parks of Scotland ticked off, isn't it? Yep. So Ruth's, where to next? Well, Ruth's left us a scratch map here, so we can scratch off the parks. Can I sniff it? No, it's not a scratch and sniff. It's just a scratch. No, just a scratch. We couldn't. Yeah, yeah, the budgets didn't go to uh, sniff. Uh, She's an expensive so, <coughs> camera to hold that flat. There yeah, you Harry, you can yeah. you can have the uh, the honours. So, uh, so the Cairngorms is here, which one. is the most northerly. So done that bad boy. Yeah. So it's pretty obvious so far because there's only two national parks in Scotland. Um, but we've got all of this stuff to do now, so we need to decide the best order to do it. So because we're here, I think it makes sense that we just go north to south. Well, that makes sense because it's all downhill, so we'll probably save, save a bit of fuel, won't we? It was time to get on the road again and bid farewell to Scotland. But the scenery of the Trossachs gave us a great send off, as if to say to the rest of the parks, Match this if you can. Another change of landscape saw us going through our first urban areas before we were cruising on the motorway towards more optimistic weather. In fact, by the time we reached the border, summer had suddenly arrived and as we entered a new country in the evening sun, we felt the faintest tingle of optimism that we may, just may, be able to pull this off. It wasn't too far to our next national park, but we were running out of daylight, so our plan was to get into position, ready for sunrise, the following morning in Northumberland National Park. Uh, what, what do you think of when someone says Northumberland National Park, apart from nothing? Sausages. No, that's Cumberland. That's Cumberland. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, no, so the, the one thing that Northumberland, uh, the national park, certainly is famous for is Hadrian's Wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's out there. So, somewhere. I mean, obviously we can't see it at the moment, but uh, so we're here in prime position. So tomorrow morning we'll get up early and we'll head up onto the wall. It's going to be a bit of a walk, isn't it? So all it leaves now is to get an early night and set the alarm for the morning. Clear skies overhead threatened overnight sub-zero temperatures, which didn't bode well for Harry, who was still missing his bedding and having to sleep in his winter jacket. Not that that bothered James or I, as we were snuggled up under a nice thick duvet. 
Separately, of course. No, no, really, separately. Next time on the National Parks Challenge. Welcome to Hadrian's Wall. I can just see the sun coming up now. Only do I not have any bedding. One of you numpties didn't put the heating on. Whoa. I do know a guy who knows it incredibly well and he's in my phone under L for legend. But the good thing is we've got a proper DSLR in the bag and we can get this shot done in about one minute. And that's it, that's your first proper photo that I'm you've a real taken. photographer. Well I don't know about that. We've nailed that. I reckon you're probably right there. I don't know about you, but I am hooked already. And thanks again to Accurate Watches for partnering with us to make this photo challenge possible. Join us next month to see what hurdles lie in wait for them on day two of their seven day National Parks photo challenge. As you can see, it's a lovely day here in Scotland, so we thought we'd come outside and enjoy the scenery. We had such a positive response to our first show of this year, so thank you to everyone who got in touch to let us know what you thought of our new format. What with our PO live shows, as well as our brand new monthly podcast there is loads of content coming your way for the remainder of the year our goal is to produce the best photography show anywhere and if you want to help us achieve this there are a number of ways that you can help the easiest is to help spread the word about photography online and expand the community of the best viewers on the planet amazingly there are still people out there who aren't aware of us so tell your friends post about us on your social media and let's get the movement going talking of photography shows this this one is back. The Photography and Video Show is Europe's largest photo retail exhibition with over 250 brands showcasing their latest products and services. The 2024 show will be held at Birmingham's NEC from the 16th to the 19th of March. So if you want to try out the latest gear from the likes of Nikon, Canon, Sony, Fuji, Sigma and many more, get tickets online from photographyshow.com where you'll also find loads of info about this exciting four-day event. There's a dedicated area for analogue fans, plus loads of live shoots where you can learn from professionals at the top of their game. As well as exploring the many stands at the show, you can also attend one of the many stages, which will be hosting talks from some of the leading names in the industry, as well as plenty of galleries to view and get inspired by, including some of the best images from the Travel Photographer of the Year Awards. Some of the UK's biggest retailers will be there, so this is the perfect place to try before you buy, and then pay special show prices for big savings on those wishlist items. Tickets are only $18.95 when purchased in advance, but you can get an extra 20% off by using our special code POTPS24. For full details, go to photographyshow.com. Having attended for the past three events, I can say firsthand that it's a great day out. Sadly, I'm unable to go this year, but you might see some of the PO team walking about, but don't let that put you off going. All right, well, I think it's time for our ever popular essential camera skills. Last month, team member Nick gave us all some great tips about macro photography. This month, we've teamed up with gadgetbag.co.uk to make use of the long winter nights by trying our hand at light painting. This is something I've always been interested in, so I tagged along to join in the fun. If you're looking to add the wow factor to your photos, then look no further than light painting. From the outside, it can seem quite technical, but you might be surprised as to what can be achieved with a single torch and a bit of practice. Light painting might be an unusual genre to specialise in, but one such person who does just that is Stephen Elliott, a Peak District based photographer whose portfolio of amazing nighttime photos speaks for itself. Ruth and I travelled to central England to track him down and see if he was willing to share some of his light painting tips and knowledge with us in the hope we could bag something worthy of a wow. 
Stephen. Hi. Hi. Hey. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hiya. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? Hi, Nick. Thanks so much for agreeing to meet us. Yeah. You're yeah. in a, a fantastic spot right now, doing a bit of landscape photography. That's correct. Yeah. I mean, the heather's looking fantastic, and but sometimes it's nice to be able to do something when it goes dark and uh, I do quite a bit of light painting. I'm guessing you do actually need a bit more equipment than what you've got right yeah, here. Yeah, we've just got a camera here, but yeah, you need all sorts of bits and pieces. Okay. I've got loads of stuff. In fact, I've got some over there. If you'd like to have a look, I Absolutely. can talk you through it. That'd be yeah. great. Cool. Although light painting can be complex, you can get some great results with the most basic of gear, as we're about to find out. So I know you're going to show us later on tonight how you actually do everything, but I'm intrigued by all these bags of interesting things. Can you explain just a few of the items that you kind of use generally for painting? Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. I mean, obviously the first thing you're going to need is something that lights up. Yep. So a torch is a very important part. I mean, I've got a bag there um, with several. So if you want to grab that bag. This one here? Yeah, just pull that out. And you can see we've got all sorts of bits and pieces in here. Um, Something like this, you've got your main bright colour, but then it'll also do blue, okay. green, <laughs> it's bright. and red, and it's bright, yeah. So that's great because you can paint all sorts of right. trees or uh, walls or whatever you like. So in terms of your torches, what's the most important thing to have? Would it be colour or the intensity of the light? So in lumens, you know, 100, 200, I mean, you said that was what, 5,000? This, this, this is 5,000. Yeah. The, the thing is, there's no one perfect torch. So a smaller torch that has got a lower output will be better for lighting up, say, um, a blade or a rod. It doesn't, you don't want it too bright. So if it lights up, you can use it. Right. So, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities mm. for, uh, for different torches. So, so you, you use these for lighting up subjects, obviously, but if someone was just to paint with light, drawing things, obviously you see people just using sparklers. Things yeah, like yeah, that, sparklers. Anything again, with a light source. Anything with a light source. Sparklers are great. In fact, I've got a nice shot where I've used a sparkler to uh, outline a person and it looks brilliant, you know. So you don't have to spend a lot of money, but it is nice to have the gear. If you The better stuff you've got, yeah. I suppose you've got more control of what you do and you can produce probably a better light painting picture. And I'm assuming the, the torches which have your RGB plus your white, they just give you more creativity. Yeah, absolutely. With the yeah, different yeah. Colors, yeah. If you want to, I mean, it's nice to light something up in white, but if you can put a blast of red into some parts of the trees and then a bit of blue or whatever, then obviously it just gives a little bit more creativity and it's that finished result. You know, you're getting all the colours and what have you. So different from landscape photography where it's critical that the heather's the right colour and the sky's the right colour and what yeah. have you. With this, you can go bonkers mm -hmm. and you can create any colour and patterns that you like. So if someone decides to go out, is it the kind of thing you can do on your own or do you actually need a bit of help, someone to hold stuff or does it just depend what you're doing? I've done stuff on my own and it's great, but you can't beat having another person with you, not just for the fact that you've got somebody to bounce the ideas off. If you also, imagine, I mean, it's lovely here now, if this was pitch dark, yeah. stumbling around here, you've got stones, you've got branches and things, so there's obviously a safety element as well, so you don't want to be falling over and banging your head. Okay, so I've actually brought some lights with me, or different kind of lighty things, maybe you can tell me if there's something that would be useful yeah, or yeah, not. Yeah. Um, sure. Thanks, Nick. Oh, right, yeah. So, a few, obviously the head torch, first of well, all, quite simple very important as well because you need to see where you're going yeah so i mean you can even use a head torch as part of um, a light painting picture i've done it where you shine a strong torch up into the sky which gives a really nice effect okay. as well but here you've got you've got an led light panel and these are uh, they're a multicolored one there so you can actually use those uh, for lighting up different areas different colors as mm -hmm. well it's it's small and compact so they'll nicely tuck out of the way you could stick that behind a tree and backlight a tree in a colour okay. and you've got a tube here which... This is my lightsaber. That's your lightsaber. That's my lightsaber, yeah. lightsaber. It's yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does the same sort of a job as, you know, as the, the, the panel, but obviously you've got more flexibility in that you can you can wave that around. You can get around. very creative with yeah, this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, really good. Now I've actually seen quite a lot of your images where you've got super creative and I don't believe you're using electric lights at all. I'm fascinated to see some of your work, like we're going to do this tonight, yeah. where you're, you've 
flinging wire wool around, you're, yeah, you're yeah. using locations yeah. to get really, really creative. Yeah. Is that something that you can have got into a little bit later on as you got your confidence well, up? Strangely enough, my first light painting image was a wire wool image. Oh. And the, the, the thing with wire wool is, it's very easy to do. You just have to be aware that it is burning wool that you're flying around. So what you don't want to be doing is setting fire to woodlands and things like that. So if you're using what wire wool, I would say beach, brilliant, quarries, uh, inside ruined buildings, caves, that sort of thing, absolutely fantastic. Okay. But you know, don't take it out into the woods. And but what about our clothing then? Yeah, safety wise. I yeah, mean I mean, I've got a light painting coat and you look at the back of it and it's got all sorts of little bits of holes burnt into it so uh, uh, like this. I'm thinking we missed a memo somewhere yes. um, maybe we could share your one well yeah you can borrow my account <laughs> because I, I would hate to burn a hole in that I would hate for you to burn a hole in that as well <laughs> or me to do it more to the point we'll we'll figure it out I want to try it or I want to see yeah, you do it's, it at it's least great fun. So. Yeah, it's really good fun. looking forward to it yeah, yeah very much so great so uh, here we are this is um, our location for the evening it's looking a bit dodgy weather wise so uh, this place is absolutely ideal it's dry it might be dripping a little bit but it's uh, it's going to be ideal another nice thing with this place is even though it's still light outside it's nice and dark in here so we're not going to have to wait a long time to uh, get set up and going so we'll get some gear together okay and uh, we'll throw some lights about Excellent. okay looking forward to this First up, Stephen suggested trying some fiery wire wool. So to do wire wool spinning, what we need is several items. A balloon whisk. Okay. <laughs> From your kitchen? From the kitchen. A dog lead, which okay. we connect it to, and some very fine wire wool. So all we do with this is we break a piece off, like so, and if you see, it's sort of like, it's all fluffy. Yeah. So what we do is we put it inside the, uh, the balloon whisk like so, fluff it out. Lots of air. Yeah, so, and what we do is we just set fire to this, and as soon as it gets going, you then spin it. So we, all we have to do is spin this, and the sparks fly off. And even though it might not look particularly impressive while you're spinning it, on the camera, yes. it shows up really, really well. So would you have an, a, a, a vision in your head of kind of the image you're wanting to create before you start spinning? Or yes, you just we do with this it? one, yeah. We know what we're going to get. What I've thought as well is we're gonna, I'm going to do a wire wool spin and then I'm going to fill in the... Because it's, I'm spinning it circularly, there's going to be a gap in the middle. Okay. And that, what we're going to do with this is we're actually going to fill the hole in with this tool here. It's actually a LED umbrella. Uh, you can get them very cheaply online, about, I don't know, 10 or 12 pounds. And all I've done is strip the umbrella parts off okay. and we're left with this shaft, which, as you can see, I can press and it'll light up. Oh, so this came from an actual... An actual umbrella, oh, okay, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, why, you know, I suppose You've you could walk down with sure. your umbrella lighting it up. <laughs> and this will do different colours. It'll also do faded colour. If you look now, it's sort of fading yes. different oranges and blues and greens and purples and so on. One of Stephen's top tips for light painting is to turn off long exposure noise reduction, otherwise you'll waste lots of time between shots. Also, make sure you do everything manually, including focusing. Aperture, I would say somewhere around about f8, yep, 100 f8, ISO. ISO 100, I'm on bulb. Yeah, have you got your cable release? I'll just use a two second delay or is it preferable to use the release? I would use a release, right, okay. and then it, you can lock it out and we'll spark it, say it's ready, and then off we'll go. Okay. If you'd like to set your shutter going. Okay, yeah. Whoa, look at that. Wow. And what I'm gonna do now is just wave this around And what that's going to do is create like a, a plasma effect. So have you chosen blue because it goes I well? Just, it just works well with yeah. the, with the orange. orange of the wire wool. It's like a Star Wars training ground. Yeah. Yeah. Jedi's. I'm just trying to imagine where the... I guess you know the length of the circle there. Yeah. So it comes to the circle. It. If I then switch that off, and you can close your shutter. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. That's so funky. It's a lot of trial and error with, uh, with steel wool because yeah. each burn is going to be slightly different. So would you merge photos together or do you, are you aiming to get it in You're one aim shot? Ideally, your light painting image should be done in one exposure. Yeah. You know, your purist. Yes. It's all done in one exposure. So you could certainly blend the two images together, but as a light painter, I wouldn't personally. So it was now my turn to play with fire. So just kind of <laughs> like yeah, this. That's exactly like that, yeah. Okay. Holy crap. Is that it? Yeah. There you go. No. Nope. Spin like Billy Woolly mackerel. <laughs> wow. That's it. Okay. Then bat on. Yeah. Yeah. So just spin. Just spin it. I think we can get away with quite a lot of... More? Yeah, with a lot more, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It just doesn't spin in your wrist the same way. Oh, no, no, it's... <laughs> it's stiff. That's what warms you up. Oh, ah, this is quite hard. I drag sort of down <laughs> below as well. Stop laughing. To your right. So <laughs> I'll do it to left then, not so. <laughs> Down below, keep going down. Down, down, and then across. That's it, yeah, there. Can I stop? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Can I see that's, that's more like better. That's, that's cool. Better than I did. <laughs> that's spot on, that. Yeah, the exposure's really good with that. Now that we were happy with our first shot, Stephen was keen to show us some other effects and techniques he likes to do, including one of his favourites, something he calls an orb. The way to do the orb is we create the shell of the orb using this light on the end. So what we do is we stand sideways onto the camera. So if I was switching that on, that's basically pointing straight down the lens. Okay. So we don't have to worry about behind us. All we need to worry about is the side and the front. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep the arm, the arm straight and then we're going to create a pattern for the orb. Obviously we're under this rock here. So we're going to create this pattern that will create a pattern the outside shell of the orb and then we switch that off when we've done that and then we swap back and we're back to the uh, same so technique as we did with the uh, with the wire wool we're filling it in and when we've done that i think what we could do is add um, the blade to bring some swirls towards the towards the camera so shutter open yep See, I'm keeping my arms straight. I'm just waving this to create a shell of the orb. I haven't done one of these for ages. And then as we come down, switch that off. And then, again, we can wave <laughs> this around. And because the length of the, the, the light on the end of the umbrella as it was doesn't go beyond here because we're using the same length this is going to fill inside the orb without causing us any issues of it going on the outside plus you'll notice the bottom part of the is slightly brighter than the, than the top so we're just basically waving this around to fill all up the the space that we've just created for the orb. I think that will do sort of a do, is it? We'll find me switch. <laughs> right. You want this one? Yes, please. I'll pass you that. Yeah, you've got that one through. <coughs> yeah. And now what we're going to do is I'm going to switch this on and come up towards the camera. Switch it off. Again, towards the camera, switch it off, again, and that should do it Nick. 
Hey. Oh, hey. <laughs> oh, come see. <laughs> That's funky. That's just psychedelic. We spent a good couple of hours at this location trying out different techniques and ideas, one of which was to use my lightsaber. But I had so much fun with the wire wool that I couldn't resist working that into the image. Quick word on safety if you want to try this. Keep your head down or wear safety goggles to prevent sparks going into your eyes. And remember, don't do this in a flammable area. Once that part was done, I stood as still as I could while Stephen painted a doorway of light behind me with a lightsaber. Yes. Have we nailed it? I think so. Woo! Here are a couple of other shots we did, all using slightly different techniques to create photos which, once you know how to do them, are really quite easy to achieve, but in my case, very different to anything I have taken before. From a creative point of view, in terms of an image that makes you think, I mean that's fantastic, it just looks like, you know, the back of the wall, step through yeah, into another, another world. Yeah, another world, yeah, another portal, another dimension. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, it's worked well. I guess this is, it's another dimension of photography, so yeah. yeah. Well, I've really enjoyed myself. No, we have as well. as well, I mean, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Pleasure. I can honestly say I had so much fun in that cave and I could have stayed there all night trying out different options to create those amazing results. And what I loved the most about it, it was the unpredictability. You really have no idea what the result's going to be before you see it on the back of the camera. And this adds to the excitement of light painting. If you'd like to give it a go for yourself, then check out gadgetbag.co.uk, who supplied most of the lights that we used for our photos. If you're one of our photography online official supporters or Poos for short, then you'll get an instant 15% off LED light wands and outdoor personal lighting. We'll be sending you the special discount code privately, so look out for it in our community tab. This is just one of the many benefits of becoming one of our Poos, and for only $3.99, it's a no brainer, as you'll save far more than that with just one purchase. So it's well worth joining if you haven't already done so. Just press the join button or use the link in the video description. And if you're finding our essential camera skills series useful, we have got three volumes of books packed with information on many aspects of photography such as depth of field, composition, how to get the sharpest shots, plus loads more. Priced at only £12.50 each, they'll arm you with everything you need to know to take your photography to the next level. They're just one of the many items available from our online store, so please have a look when you get a chance. As always, there's a link in the video description. Okay, well, it's now time for our special feature. This could be anything which doesn't fit into the other categories in the show. And last month, it saw Harry on a photo tour around Namibia. So if you didn't see that show yet, certainly put it on your list of things to watch. This month, Harry is joined by James. And although they're staying a little bit closer to home, they're aiming to get photos which look like they've traveled a lot further afield. They've teamed up with Sigma, who've loaned them a few of their excellent lenses to help them with their task. Wildlife can be an incredibly rewarding genre of photography, but one which many can be scared away from trying. Firstly, there's the assumption that you'll need specialist gear, such as expensive long lenses and a camera with state-of-the-art focusing and a super fast frame rate. Then, of course, you need the skills to get you in the right place at the right time, which can mean stalking or sitting in a hide for hours at a time. And then there's the fact that many iconic species probably won't exist in the wild near to where you're based, so there's the added expense of travel and accommodation to consider. But if you don't want to break the bank, or don't have the time to invest in going on an exotic safari in Africa or Asia, is it still possible to achieve some decent animal shots worthy of adding to your portfolio? 
This is what James and I are here to try and find out today. We're here at Chester Zoo, one of the more photography friendly zoos here in the UK due to its lack of barriers between you and the wildlife, but a little bit more on that later. We've come armed with a couple of bags full of very affordable lenses. There's a zoo full of animals. Should we go have a good day out? Yeah, let's get started. Let's get started. Chester Zoo is fairly well situated in the middle of the UK, so it's easy to get to for most people living in Britain. But there are many other zoos dotted around the UK, and the world for that matter, which are also photo friendly. Try to avoid zoos where they keep animals in unnatural environments, as apart from being immoral, having a tiger against a concrete background isn't going to get you a great photograph. So here we are in the flamingo enclosure. Now the key thing about flamingos is obviously the colour. So that's what I'm going to try and document. And I'm going to pick out an individual bird, one at the front of the flock, isolate that and let the rest towards the back become the backdrop, become the canvas of the pictures. I'm using a DSLR with a Sigma 150 to 600 mil lens, which is ideal for zoo or indeed any other wildlife photography, as it has a great zoom range. It's also light enough to handhold all day long. Plus, it doesn't break the bank. Remember, our aim here today is to try and get great wildlife shots which could be in the wild. If we are successful, then the viewer should have no indication that these animals are captive. I think this one ticks the box. So I've seen this small palm growing here. Now the flamingos are passing back and forth through that palm and watching that kind of behaviour even in a zoo is really quite important. So I'm going to give it a go and try and shoot through the palm to the birds themselves. Having had a good start with the flamingos, we went in search of our next subject. Chester Zoo is home to 82 species of animal, so there was a lot to choose from. As we wandered around in the morning light, it wasn't long before I spotted something which caught my interest. Fantastic thing about zoos is it gives you opportunities to see species that you might never get a chance to see in the wild. So I've been fortunate to travel to many places, but I've never managed to see Congolese buffalo in the wild. And here I am standing just a few feet away from these beautiful animals. And luckily today, we've got some really nice light filtering down through the trees and it's just spotlighting different animals. So just because we're in a zoo and we're photographing captive subjects, doesn't mean that the light isn't important. We need to consider the direction of light, where it's striking, or wait for the animals to move into a patch of light. I've got a little bit of control as to which direction I move in and even trying to either backlight the subjects or bring the light in from the side. Really, I'm just trying to avoid having the sun directly behind me because then I'm evenly lighting the buffalo and it doesn't really look that interesting. There's not enough contrast in the images. Just like James, for this shot, I'm using a Sigma 150 to 600 millimeter lens as it provides the perfect focal range for this kind of photography. Here, it's allowing me to isolate individual animals and shoot over the bar in the foreground, even for someone who's vertically challenged like me. After a couple of slow moving subjects in good light, we felt it was now time for something slightly more challenging. So we headed over to the penguins, where we each had a different idea of what we were hoping to achieve. So here we are, Harry, at the penguin enclosure. I know both of us were looking forward to seeing this particular exhibit. Um, lots of action, a couple of different vantage points, obviously above the water and below the water. I know that you want a leaping shot. I don't ambitious. know whether you get, it's ambitious. You're going to get it? Well, well, we'll find out shortly anyway. And I particularly want to shoot through the glass. So, uh, but so, you know, I don't, I've never really been successful shooting through glass. It's quite tricky. So what do we need to do to try and... Well, it's all about it? eliminating reflections. And actually here at the zoo, they've built it pretty well anyway. So it is in quite a lot of shade, but this very cheap accessory is just a rubber lens hood, fits on multitude of lenses, flexible silicone thing, eBay, $10, 10 pounds, whatever it is. 
will help me eliminate that. What, what about you, Haya? What are your challenges there? Well, it's the background, really. Trying to, you can't get, you can't get level with the water. So I've just got to get low enough, and then hopefully try and try and get a bird coming towards me or side on without too much of the sort of distracting background that we've got around here. Absolutely right. Well, should we go give it a go? See how we get on. key for me here really is trying to make sure I've got a super fast shutter speed, trying to freeze the action as the birds jump around and splash, and then using continual focus. Trying to just obtain focus on the birds, difficult, but you just gotta keep, keep going. Rinse and repeat, take as many shots as you can. Once again, the 150 to 600 millimeter lens is perfect for this shot, as I'm right in the middle of its range, allowing me to change the composition when I need to react. Meanwhile, I'd been using my flexible lens hood to shoot the penguins underwater. It worked a treat to reduce all those reflections on the glass, and I got some good quality shots which I'm really pleased with. I like this one as it clearly shows it's an underwater shot. This one is also good, but would be better if there were just a few more bubbles to indicate it's a sub-aqua environment. As we continued our wanderings, the next animal to catch our attention were the camels. So here we are, pretty close to the animals this time, so there's no real need for huge focal lengths, but what I've got is a fast prime lens, and that allows me to have a very wide aperture, very narrow depth of field, to really focus in on the creature itself, to really show that intimate detail. As you can see, the background here wasn't ideal, but the use of a fast prime lens allowed me to deal with this by throwing it well out of focus. The lens in question is the amazing Sigma 135mm f1.8, which is perfect for a close-up portrait of an animal of this size at this distance. I'm using the lens at f2 to throw the background way out of focus and isolate the camel, free of distractions. So here we are at the Painted Dogs, Harry. I believe one of your favourite animals. When was the uh, last time you saw them? Not that long ago, actually. I've, I've spent a lot of time in Africa trying to photograph these in the wild unsuccessfully I might add. <laughs> well I think you've probably got something because I have seen it but here obviously we're in a controlled environment and there's a bit of a bit of an issue where we look down but luckily we've got one that's almost on the same level haven't yeah, we Yeah it's quite nice looking basically just across to it and yeah. the background is far enough away from it that it's nicely out of focus there's quite a nice bit of animal behaviour as it's eating its lunch. So there's some good stuff in there, Harry. We've had a pretty good day overall. Yeah, we haven't brushed about. We just picked a couple of key subjects yeah. and not necessarily the big ticket stuff. I mean, no, and I think we were very species. sensible not to rush about as well because it gave us time to uh, practice our skills on these individual animals that we found. Well, I know it sounds obvious, doesn't it? But practice does make perfect. Yeah. And if people ask us, the best way to improve their photography. I don't know about you, but the, the answer I give, no matter whether we're talking about wildlife photography, landscapes, portraits, is if you do it enough so that the, the technical aspect becomes yeah. automatic and the controls yeah. of the camera, then you can spend a lot more time thinking about the light that's hitting your subject and making sure mm -hmm. you're standing in the right position. Mm -hmm. And zoos are such a yeah, great place. Yeah, in nature with the camera. Lots of practice here, and, and of course you don't have to be in a zoo, you can put this into practice in the wider field, mm -hmm. across where you, near where you live, or abroad, and um, you can actually, in a funny way, save an awful lot of money if you end up on a big safari one day with these skills honed and ready to go, ready to put into practice. Yeah, no, I think the yeah. zoos are the, one of the best places to nail think, those skills we should, down. We should definitely be back. I think we'll be back. Yeah, I think we'll be back too. So with all our shots in the bag, it was time to visit my favourite exhibit at the zoo, the ice cream kiosk. Thank you. Been to 
client. Spent all your money. <laughs> Can you imagine he got the client? Can't even afford an ice cream. <laughs> Our advice for spending a day with your camera at the zoo would be to Choose a zoo which keeps the animals in natural environments and doesn't have lots of glass or bars in the way. Ideally, you want to support a zoo which invests its money back into the welfare and conservation of their animals. Plan in advance and choose a few key subjects to spend time on rather than rushing around trying to see everything. Find out when feeding times are and try to coincide your visit to each animal around this time. Pay attention to backgrounds and the direction of light and position yourself accordingly. You don't want direct sunlight coming from behind you. On an overcast day though, this doesn't matter. Avoid busy times such as public holidays or school holidays when zoos are likely to be far busier places. Also, Check that tripods are allowed before setting any up. We chose not to use them on our day. Thanks to Sigma for partnering with us for this month's special feature. If you're interested in finding out more about any of the lenses Harry and James were using, there's a link in the video description. Also, if you join us for our PO live show this month, we'll be looking at all the lens options for you if you want to get the best budget or best performing wildlife lens. Basically, if you're in the market for a new lens, then this is something you really don't want to miss. On the subject of our live show, hopefully you got to join us last month when we made it available to everyone to join in. From this month, Peel Live will only be available to our Poos, a collection of the finest human beings on the planet. It's thanks to these amazing people that we're able to make these shows. As I mentioned earlier, if you want to join them and get all the benefits, simply press the join button. You can cancel at any time, but I think you'll find it's the best £3.99 you're likely to spend all month. Okay, well it is time to make someone very happy. Last month, we announced our biggest ever prize. The Isle of Skye draws in photographers from all over the world who come here to capture its amazing diversity of landscapes illuminated by the unique Hebridean light. And at no time is this better than during the winter months. As well as the world-class landscapes, there's an abundance of wildlife on offer too. We are giving you the chance to win a week-long photography holiday for up to six people. You'll be staying in this log cabin situated right on the shore overlooking the mighty Kulin Mountains. You can even get a amazing shots from the decking or relax in front of the wood fire. With three bedrooms, all of which sleep two people and numerous areas to chill out and look through your photos from the day, this really is the perfect base for a photo trip. Now as good as that is, we thought we would make the prize even better, so we've added a couple more bits for you. One of the team members from Photography Online will spend a day with you, showing you some of our favourite secret locations on the island and helping you to improve your photography. After a dawn shoot here at the world famous Kerrang, we will take you just over there to our first choice for a full Scottish breakfast, the Uwe Hotel, before continuing a great day of photography around the rest of the island. And then, to top it all off, you can come and watch us record some of Photography Online and meet myself. Hang on, surely that makes the prize less attractive. No? Well, you don't have to do that part if you don't want to. All in all though, it is worth over £2,000. So keep watching to find out how this amazing prize could be yours. Thanks to everyone who entered last month via our website link. All you had to do was count how many hot air balloons appeared in our Namibia feature in last month's show. The answer was 16, a figure which has been checked by many people and independently verified. There were almost a thousand of you who entered, but only 144 got the answer correct. Sadly, only one of you can be the winner, and to choose who that is, we've got our Photography Online Wheel of Fortune, something which usually only sees the light of day during our PO live show. Now, there was too many of you to put names around here individually, so we split everyone into colours with 24 people in each block, so we're going to have an elimination round to start off with. Let's go. So the 24 people from the red section are now appearing on the screen and by the magic of television, the names are now on the board. So now we've got our finalists, let's give it one final spin. Ooh. Oh, just Lewis Fink. 
There we go. Congratulations, Lewis. We will be in touch to discuss all the details of your prize and look forward to meeting you either towards the end of this year or the beginning of next. If you weren't lucky this time, keep entering our future competitions as someone has to win and it might as well be you. All right, well, after all that excitement, I think it's time to go on a photo shoot. Zip your jacket up as this one's going to be wild. It's a gloomy December day, and I'm on my way to take a photo for which I've had to wait almost a year for the conditions to be right. More on that in a moment, but let me tell you where I'm going. Afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the crew, welcome aboard the Hebrides for the sailing. I'm heading to the Isle of Scalpe, which is pretty remote even by Scottish standards. To get there, you first have to get to the Isle of Skye, where you take this ferry to the Isle of Harris. I'm on my way to photograph a lighthouse. This is not it. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can I have your attention, please? That's the vessel now arriving at Tarbert. Would all vehicle drivers and the passengers please make your way to the vehicle deck now? We'd like to thank you for travelling with us today. And wish you a safe and pleasant onward journey. Thank you. After an hour and 40 minutes, you arrive in the small town of Tarbert, from where it's another 25 minutes drive to my location on the Isle of Scalpe. But before that, I need some food and I want to show you why I've chosen tomorrow as my day to take the shot. This is the forecast, which looks ideal for what I need. Firstly, I need strong winds from either the south or the east. And as you can see here, they're from the south in the middle of the day. I also need dark moody skies with a good chance of direct sun breaking through which is what is being suggested here. After a cold night in the van, I can start the final leg of my journey, a two kilometer walk to Ellen Glass Lighthouse. This usually isn't too much of an ordeal, but due to the 50 mile an hour winds I'm gonna to have to shoot in, I've had to bring my biggest and heaviest tripod, plus my camera bag is not light either. You'll see why in a minute. But let's stop feeling sorry for me and let me tell you a bit about this lighthouse as it has a good bit of history behind it. Originally built in 1789, the lighthouse here was one of the first four ever built in Scotland. That lighthouse still exists, but was replaced by the taller red and white tower in 1824, and it's still in operation today. That means a light has shone from this position every night for the past 234 years. Back in the 1700s, jobs were clearly not as disposable as they are today. A classic Stevenson lighthouse, the main attractions for me are primarily its red and white stripes, and secondly, its location within the landscape. Well, here I am, and the stupid thing is, I only live about 15 miles over there on a clear day, you can see my house from here. Yeah, I had to leave almost 24 hours ago to get here for now. But hey, that's the Scottish Islands for you. Right, the conditions are perfect. I'm gonna walk around, get set up, and then we'll talk about this shot. Now what I've done is I've invested some time in wandering around and exploring all the different angles of this lighthouse. Now I've been here before on a couple of occasions, so I had a good idea of roughly where I wanted to take this photo from, but I had to refine it. And this here is the exact point, and we'll talk about why in just a moment. But the light's getting good, so I'm just gonna set up first so I don't miss anything. I've chosen my camera carefully for this shot. It's clearly a panoramic format scene, but this leaves me with three main options. The first would be to shoot digitally and do a multi-shot stitch, but that won't work due to the movement of the water and the sky, which make up a large part of the frame and would therefore be too difficult to join together. My second option is the one I've chosen, a medium format panoramic camera capable of taking a super high resolution shot in a single capture. I do have a third option, 
an ultra-large format panoramic camera, but that's a non-starter in high winds. I also can't shoot in colour on that camera, so this Fuji GX617 is the obvious tool for the job. So I'm all set up, I've got a 180mm lens on, it's giving me the perfect framing for this scene. Now the reason I've turned up today is as you can probably hear, it's very windy. The wind is whipping up the sea and it's putting some drama and action and movement in the water, which you don't normally get at this location. So I've actually waited for quite a long time for the conditions to be perfect for what I'm looking for. We need an offshore wind, which is very unusual because the prevailing winds for this location typically come from that direction. So this area of water is normally sheltered, but today we've got the winds whipping in from this side and that's giving us loads of movement in the water, which is key for this photo to work. Now, it's just a case of waiting for dark moody skies in the background, which as you can see, we don't have at the moment, but because of the wind, that's changing all the time. And we've got dark moody clouds all around. So we just need one to blow in behind there and we need to rely on a little bit of luck and get sharp winter light on that lighthouse at the same time that we've got some dark moody skies going on. So although there's a lot of planning in shots like this, we're still relying on a little bit of luck, but you have to be in it to win it. And I'm here and I'm willing to stick it out until I get the luck that I need. So fingers crossed, just gonna wait it out, see what happens. So this is the light that I want, but I don't have the background that I'm ideally looking for. But I think the light's just gonna keep coming and going as the day progresses. And all we need to do is wait for it to coincide with a decent background, and hopefully I've got the shot. If I don't get it today, I'll come back tomorrow. If I don't get it tomorrow, I'll come back the next day. I'm not giving up, it's not gonna beat me. The best thing about unsettled weather is the range of lighting conditions it provides in a short space of time, which makes it ideal for landscape photography. The worst thing about it is that sooner or later, rain is pretty much guaranteed to arrive. So the rain's just about to hit. I can see it coming across the water and it ain't gonna be good. sunlight on me but not yet on the lighthouse but it's coming it's just a case of waiting for a wave now landscape photography is often about waiting for all the planets to align here I need three things to happen all at the same time now that I have two of them the waves have deserted me but not for long here's the first attempt which is okay for starters but although I can't yet see the image, I already know it's not really the shot I came for. We've got another really dark, moody cloud coming over, heading straight towards me. However, the light on the far side of this cloud might be even better than what we just had. So I'm definitely gonna stick around, see if I can better what I've already got. So here comes the light again. Look at that backdrop this time. This is gonna be even better. So we've got the perfect background. We've got epic light on the lighthouse. I'm just waiting for the right wave now. And I'm also adopting a power pose. That makes the photo that much more dramatic. There I was, patiently waiting for three elements to coincide all at the same time, when unexpectedly, a fourth decided to turn up. We've even got a rainbow going off on the left here. This is the shot I had in mind. It has drama, atmosphere, mood, and attitude. The addition of the rainbow might not have been planned, but I'll take it. You can't ask for more than that. We've got the rainbow, we had the wave, we've got the light, we've got the background. Hey!
What an amazing shot. It just goes to show that if you put the effort in, you'll often be rewarded with exactly what you want and maybe even more. Next month on Analog Affairs, I'll be off to Venice, armed with a couple of 35mm film cameras, one of which we'll be giving away, so the winning just keeps on coming. Don't forget to check out the Photography Online podcast, which is free to access and is available on Spotify, Apple, and all the usual podcast platforms. The latest episode has just become available, and it's a great thing to listen to when you're walking the dog or doing the ironing. Okay, well, walking the dog. If you enjoyed the show, then do please consider supporting us by pressing the join button. You can also purchase items from our shop, or you can just help spread the word and expand the photography online community. Whatever you choose to do, we really appreciate it, and you can feel a sense of pride that you're an integral part of the show. Next month, we'll be following the guys on day two of the National Parks Challenge. We head out under the night skies in our essential camera skills, giving you all the information you need to get great astro and aurora shots. We'll be off to a lesser known location in Dartmoor. And as I've already said, I'll be venturing to Venice. Well, someone has to do it. Until next time, take good care, but most of all, take good photos. Welcome to the world's second least densely populated country. A vast wilderness filled with some of the highest sand dunes in the world, the world's oldest desert, and the second largest canyon. Looks can be deceiving, but no, I'm not in Scotland. I'm actually in Namibia. Nestled in the southwestern corner of Africa, I'm regularly told this is a remarkable country. We have led photographic holidays to many places around the world, but usually to places that we already know very well or places we have lived previously. However, we're running out of those places, so I've decided to try and add a new destination to the lineup. I'm here for a couple of weeks exploring some honeypot locations and hopefully some lesser known spots as well. I'm in a generous mood, so why don't you come along with me and see what I get up to. It was set to be a jam-packed few weeks of long days, epic locations, and a real taste of the African desert. I sacrificed one sunrise in this amazing place to take to the skies rather than the sand, and jumped into a hot air balloon, a first for me. Think of it as drone photography, but with none of the angst over crashing it. So sit back and enjoy the views. Mm -hmm. 